from the boom boom room of the Hollywood Athletic Club. Yeah, it's <laughs> oh, Saturday morning. <laughs> okay. Good morning, uh, Los Angeles. Good morning, Los Angeles. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Jordan Pacheco. That down there, if he is down there still, is Rudolfo Carlos. And because we kidnapped him yet again, we have the indomitable Charles Cologne back with us, all the way 6,000 miles, allegedly, across the pond in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you believe it? This is all breakfast in Hollywood. Woo! Broadcast you from Sunset and Vine. <laughs> and now the weather report. That's right. <laughs> it is a sunny 30 degrees here in Colorado. <laughs> how's, 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 how's everything been? How has winter in Austria been treating you? Well, we had our, our first snowfall two days ago. Ooh. And you must understand that when we moved out to L.A., I was a little boy. And if there was anything I missed, it was snow. Hmm. So the past several years, when I've come out for the first snow of the winter, I, I get all excited. The little five-year-old in me just jumps up and down. And he says, boy, I'm not in L.A. anymore. And he's happy for that, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, it, what's sad is that those of my classmates who are Californians, Southern Californians, and there are a few, are not happy right now. And they don't understand, since I've lived there most of my life, why I'm not similarly doleful. But this is, <laughs> they don't understand. This is, for me, it's Mount Kisco in 1964. Yay! Yeah. Groovy. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that comes later. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, well, I'm in uh, Colorado. So we've been hit or miss with snow. There's no snow right now, but there was snow earlier this week. And since I was in L.A. for five years, uh, I missed looking at snow rather than dealing with snow, if that makes sense. I didn't miss scraping yeah. off my car. I didn't miss uh, black ice. I didn't miss almost dying. I didn't miss having to shovel <laughs> off a driveway. <laughs> uh, you, you see how you are? You're, you're, you've got to accentuate the positive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's the song, isn't it? It, it sure is. <laughs> a song that, that should oh, be yeah. Los Angeles' sure. national anthem. <laughs> you got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess the mister in between. That's the one. It's astounding how dated that stuff has become. What? Yeah, you heard me. <laughs> Who's going out with it? Uh, uh, Who's nope. dating it? I want to know. Who's going out with it? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Jen, if you're watching. <laughs> yeah, Jen, if you're watching, I'm going out with the song. Put your hand in the hand. of. Oh, gosh. Okay. No. <laughs> so, first off, thank you to all of our subscribers. We've had such an influx since your last episode. A lot of people, really, really positive ratings and reviews on, on you on with us. And we're very grateful because uh, if you haven't seen the last episode we did with Charles, go watch it. I'm going to post it like right there. You can't miss it. And what you can see is from firsthand account of a person who lived at the time uh, a little bit before, during, and after the Second Vatican Council. So if you want to learn about nuns who ditch their habits, if you want to learn about put your hand in the hand of the man, if you want to learn about recovations, talk to that guy or that guy, whichever way he is, uh, because it is a crazy episode and we haven't even gotten through we got through half of it when he had to stop it was so good um so i thought that we would do something that is usually uncharacteristic in the podcast world which is pick up where we left off <laughs> uh i know the good, heard about, of uh, the good thing about charles is like it's like sitting in front of a campfire and having the elder tell you all the stories of <laughs> the past the elder <laughs> The it one. was a, it was a cold, it was a cold and stormy decade. <laughs> 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 All right, maybe two or three. Oh my! <laughs> <Or> right. <four. laughs> so it, it never the hits never stopped. Mm -hmm. well, this <laughs> they is, kept this on is, coming. This is the <laughs> biggest thing that we picked up on is is the fact that once a ball got rolling, it really started rolling. The fact that uh, it was it's Cardinal uh, was it. Uh, McIntyre or who was the, your uh, your spiritual director uh, the one that McIntyre. sent you to McIntyre yes so the fact that Cardinal McIntyre sends you to the Anglo Catholics because he can tell that you're 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 not getting it with with what's supposed to be the liturgy that that Christ himself is present in 
Um, Put your hand in the hand of the man who's still the woman. <laughs> yes, yes. That that left something to be uh, desired. Um, the great communion hymn. Today, while the blossoms still... What, what, what? I can't believe that's a real song. I looked it up and I'm like, there's no way it's... It's it's so not it's appropriate. It's so not what are you saying? It's I know excuse me. Who's the <laughs> Jesuit pastor here? Oh yeah. They're very you or father, you or father O'Gara. Yeah. Oh, forgive me, Father. Forgive yeah. me. Sorry. Thank Sorry. you. I'm 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 doing Thank that you. sin, the only sin which exists, which is uh which is uh judging uh the human elements <laughs> of things. Bless you, Rudy. Precisely. Thank you. Precisely right. What you gotta bear in mind is that they were pioneering a new way of being church. So a new way of doing church. Being church is accurate too, according to what I'm reading from Mahoney. We are church, they would say. We are, you are church. You are Eucharist and, and all that well, stuff. We, there was a, um, there was a, a uh, let me see if I can find it online. There was a particularly obnoxious hymn uh, Oh, heavens. It was, uh, it had the, the, the words in it, I myself am the bread of life. I uh, am the bread, not that one. No, I don't remember the tune of it, thankfully. Oh, no, no that one. I remember, I, mean, the, I remember, ah, yeah, there, by Rory Cooney, that great mm -hmm. author of something or other. This is it. I myself am the bread of life. You and I are the bread of life. Taken and blessed, broken and shared by Christ that the world may live. The bread is spirit, gift of the maker's love, and we who share it know we can be one, a living of God in Christ. I myself am the bread of life, you and I are the bread of life, take your blessed, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to put how it actually sounds because this isn't live, which means I'm gonna actually splice it in so our audience can get a dose of daily cancer. Which is so you really, you really you really want to torch to them, eh? Ah, you know, give them a run for their Jordan, money. that's like the uh, the article you sent the other day where the the community was saying, "I am Eucharist." Oh gosh. Yep. I'm Eucharist yep. when I let people inside. Yep. I am oh. Eucharist when blah 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 blah. Yeah, I'm <laughs> Eucharist when I help an old lady across the street. I'm Eucharist when I. Oh no, no, it was. I gave him Eucharist. Oh yes. So. <laughs> So Charles, we have we have a little thread, me, uh, Rudy, and another buddy. And what we do is we, we we try to find what's called the morning the morning cancer or the morning cringe, and we just find like like the worst nervous ordos or the worst like articles or the worst of the spirit of Vatican II, essentially. And Charles, do you want to join? Yeah, you want to join, I've, Charles? <laughs> I've got something special for you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is from the Western uh, Benedictines in Vermont. Uh, it, you know, don't be shocked, but it was copyright 1972. Let's go. <laughs> it used to be played at weddings a lot. And most of it is a recitative rather than it's spoken rather than sung. I don't remember the tune. I remember hearing it. The tune, uh, the song words, the, the, the beginning and end verse and the long gap in between. The first verse is, wherever you go, I shall go. Wherever you live, so shall I live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God too. Now here's the recitation. I want to say something to all of you who have become a part of the fabric of my life. The color and texture which you have brought into my being have become a song, and I want to sing it forever. There is an energy in us which makes things happen when the paths of other persons touch ours, and we have to be there and let it happen. When the time of our particular sunset comes, our thing, our accomplishment, won't really matter a great deal. 
but the clarity and care with which we have loved others will speak with vitality of the great gift of life we have been for each other. And then the, the finale, wherever you die, I shall die, and there I shall be buried beside you. We will be together forever, and our love will be the gift of our life. Uh, Jordan, so save that for your uh, wedding speech. <laughs> That's a good I, uh, one. Congratulations, Charles. You are definitely in the group because that has been the cringiest thing we've heard all week, I would say, Rudy. Should we get a clap? Thank you. It's pretty Thank bad. You. That's pretty good. Oh, feeling a little sick to our stomachs, are we? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh gosh. So that's the Western Benedictines who did that in 72. So, <laughs> the golden age of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great title for this. <laughs> for those who don't know, and I've been posting, I've been telling people to read them because they are so good. Uh, you were, Charles, in the 90s to the mid-2000s, it seems. I'm sure plenty of other places. One of the places you were writing for was the Los Angeles Lay Catholic Mission, which seems to be, according to the articles I read, and I've read all of them, a ragtag group of <laughs> decent Catholics trying to make sense of the mess that, uh, that had Catholicism uh, had become in in uh, in California. Is that fair? Because there's Los Angeles, no. there's Orange, there's San Fran San Francisco's Roman Catholics are abhorrent, but that's not surprising. Well, I, it, there were four papers in the chain. Uh, one was in Spanish, uh, La Cruz de Californias, uh, which was actually it was published in both. It, it was circulated both in uh, Alta and Baja, but it circulated with the uh, approval of the Baja bishops not oddly enough the Alta bishops for reasons I, I who knows. Uh, then there were three English language papers in the chain. Uh, there was the San Diego News Notes, which was sort of the flagship. Uh, and then there was uh, Jim Holman was our publisher and owner. Um, and then there was the uh, Los Angeles Lake Catholic Mission. And lastly, the San Francisco Faith. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we had a good time because, you know, again, you know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And the, the uh, you'll have noticed if you've read a number of, of, my, uh, of my mass reviews, because that's what they were really, I never, I never opined. I never uh, said something was good or bad. I just described what happened. And, you know, sometimes I really had to bite my tongue because it would be so stupid that, you know, how do you say the man's a moron without saying he's a moron? And it, it wasn't that difficult. I mean, and, and time and again, I would have priests call me outraged of my coverage. Mm. And I would say, well, you know, Father, here's the question. Uh, was I lying? You know, if, if, if I was lying, you shut me down. But if I was telling the truth, oh, there's a problem, all right, but it's not me. Uh, yeah. And I, I, so I wanted to, for those who don't know, so will you tell us a little bit about specifically your, one of your columns inside? Because besides writing, also just general good articles on what seems like current events and news happening in the California Catholic world, um, you also have a little thing called the Roman Catholic. And so that was your... That was your review of the masses. What's great about them is they're very cut and dry, very objective. Like there's nothing to dispute. You tell us what the opening hymn was. You tell us what the altar servers were wearing, how many altar girls there were, if there was ever a deacon, what the priest was, a little history of the priests. Um, what what kind of spurred on this this sort of column? Because I think it's brilliant. I think it's one of those great gems uh, that we can all look back on for to just prove that this stuff happened. Well, I wish I could tell you that it was my invention, but it wasn't. Uh, it was, in fact, the brainchild of our, of our owner and publisher, Mr. Holman, uh, who uh, already had a, had a similar deal going on in the San Diego News Notes. Roman Catholic was his idea also, the name, which, you know, at the time I didn't really care for. It struck me as kind of too cute for its own good. <laughs> but I, I kind of got used to it. And... Uh, you know, I, I, I traveled all over the archdiocese, which was a lot of fun. And what I, um, 
what I was not in a position to really say in the column was how much I enjoyed some of the churches uh, and some of the people, mm. uh, not not the uh, clergy usually, but the people. And of course, after mass, it was always it was always a lot of fun to uh, hang out with them and you know chat with people and so on, and the um, you know and pretend to be uh, sane. Uh, one of the uh, once about midway through my through my uh, career there. Uh, for reasons that escaped me, but it was just, I intended this one-off deal and just for a bit of fun because they had a particularly lavish uh, coffee and donut sequence after the mass. And so I talked about it, you know, what the donuts were and, and what the uh, coffee were. I've got a, a huge uh, a huge weakness for glazed donuts myself. So it's, it's not like I didn't have a dog in this fight. So I put that out and it was a gag really. I was just, being funny, so I didn't do it the next time. And we got all these irate letters. The one there uh, says to me, "You need to put in the coffee and donuts." So from that time on, I religiously put in whatever the aftermath was like. And I'll tell you, I, I I don't know how it is now, although I suspect it hasn't changed. But the best aftermath in terms of refreshments, food, etc. Other than the Eastern Rites, you usually have a lot of good stuff. Mm. Uh, is San Conrado Mission by a Dodger Stadium? Hmm. I'd believe it. Oh man, those guys know. I mean, <laughs> uh, menudo, tamales, uh, ochata, coffee, uh, the whole nine yards. I was gonna say oh. I, would, I would be I'd be upset if the if the the heavily uh, Spanish communities didn't didn't uh, didn't step up. <laughs> Oh no, they, they were, I mean, I, I miss my glazed donuts, but you can always, you, you can always bribe me with Mexican food. Mm. There's, just, there's no doubt about that. And the, the uh, interesting enough here in Vienna, the only uh, bit, the only Mexican dish I can get that's quasi authentic is chicken mole. Ooh, really? Yeah. What kind the, of, the brown no one? Pozole. What's that? Is it the brown one or like the green one? It's the red, the brown, brownish red. Oh, okay, that one's really good. Yeah, it, it is. But I mean, everything else in this, the, the one place I know, it's, well, it's about as Mexican as I would make. But mm -hmm. for some reason, their mole is really, really, really good. They used to make pozole, apparently, but they discontinued it, sadly. Oh. Which, and pozole is about my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my, my family and my New Mexico roots means that it's pozole and green chili and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I want to I want to read um, just a little section from an article or two from Roman Catholic, just to kind of give our audience a sense of the writing style and also the times. Um, so I found a couple. This one is uh, from Precious Blood uh, in Los Angeles. So it's very nice, by the way, is what Charles does is Charles tells us usually what Sunday that you're at, what the date is. So we have a good timestamp. Uh, so they can't, they can't, they can't doctor it later. Um, so this is the 1230 mass on Trinity Sunday, June 15th in, uh, in 2003, Ugh. it looks like. So uh, <laughs> just to give a timestamp. And so the priest celebrating is Father of Brogan. The, the parish is Precious Blood, which is on Occidental Boulevard in LA. And what I like also about, uh, about these articles, Charles, is that you don't just hit the mass, we also hit the architecture, the environment, yeah. and the people attending. So just a little bit of a precursor, it says that uh, Precious Blood Church is one of the Archdiocese's architectural gems and, as yet, little wrecked inside. It is a fusion-style basilica with Gothic features, such as a rose window. Although the gate to the sanctuary is gone, the altar rail remains intact, as does the high altar, albeit unclothed complete with a tabernacle in the center, but it is the mosaics in the sanctuary which are especially notable. The ceiling portrays in mosaic the Trinity with angels below and at last, a mosaic crucifix overhanging the altar with blood depicting, or with blood depicted pouring out of our Lord's side down to the tabernacle. So I, I very much think that it's good that, because oftentimes I'll look at what the churches are afterwards and some of them are, not this way anymore and some of them are have preserved it or have gone even more traditional um so it's just such a good timestamp because for a lot of us one of the questions that we have is 
what was the period of the recovations, you know? We often think it just happened in a decade, but for some places it was more gradual, it seems. Yeah, it, it, it all depended. I mean, and some places like Precious Blood, other than ripping out the gates, they never did much of anything anyway. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I mean, like Precious Blood, the best churches you'll find are the ones that were built when the neighborhood was rich. And when the time of the recreation came, it was dead poor. Mm. Because like Blessed Sacrament, uh, my home parish in Hollywood, the Jesuit parish, or like Sacred Harp in Lincoln Heights, or like Precious Blood, uh, there just was no money to destroy them. You know, they, they, they just didn't have it. What money they had had to go into basic survival for the parish, mm -hmm. which, but you could tell that there was money there when they were built. And, and as I say, that's the best. What you don't want uh, is a place that had money after the council, because then the priest could do what he wanted. And uh, very often what he wanted to do was destruction. Um, this is... As to the, oh, no, what were you saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, as to the when, for the most part, it was the 70s. But I have to say for the most part, because... Uh, there would be places that escaped the first wave. And then in the late 80s, sometimes the early 90s, sometimes even later, you'd have some elderly moron come along and rip it apart. Um, you know, I, and if I sound bitter, it's because I am. Yeah. You know, that was not their property. That's what the little kids, the preachers didn't understand. If it had been built with their money, and their blood and their toil, that'd be one thing, but it wasn't. Uh, many years ago, I was in a bar in uh, Morgan City, Louisiana. Yeah, I know that would shock you that I was in a bar, but I was. <laughs> uh, observing the, the Cajun culture close up. Naturally. Well, the bartender slash owner was this elderly redheaded lady. And she asked me if I had been in the church. Well, I had been. And the funny thing about the church is it was then. It was very close to this bar. It was terribly recreated, but a side altar was intact and beautiful, which made no sense because usually when they wreck the high altar and they wreck the mm -hmm. other side altar, mm -hmm. they're not going to wreck that. But I mean, they will wreck that. It'd be a total thing. But she explained to me that her father had been the one who paid for that altar. And wow. sometimes they went down a meal or two a day to pay for it. And so when the priest who was tearing things apart, started tearing things apart uh he uh he showed up uh with a, with a she ran up there and said look father i'll tell you what that marble is my model not yours and if you want to get rid of it i'm gonna have a truck here and we'll take it away and then she looked at me and she goes that solid marble side altar is still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and she said something else to me, which I've never forgotten. She said, and she's a lot older than me. And she goes, I mean, and we're, this is about, I'd say 1990 that we're having this discussion. And she, I think was at least 65 or 70. She was up there. Mm -hmm. She says, you know something in those days, it was to people's church. Now it's to priest's church. Hmm. Them days, they had to work, they had to do the mass out of the missile, and that was it. Today, they just make up whatever pop it in their head. And I thought about that. And what she didn't know was that years later, she would spark a German language joke in my mind here in Austria, although she's actually the unknown authoress of it. Uh, they tend to call the card table put in front of beautiful high altars here. And, and that's one of the rules in Europe. The more beautiful the high altar, the more ridiculous the card table. That's, uh... <laughs> it's, it's, I, I don't know why, but it's the basic rule. So in German, what they call the new altar is the Volksaltar, the people's altar. Mm. But I always call it the Priesteraltar. <laughs> is... Priesteraltar. Like, what? Well, it wasn't the people who put it in, was it? Although maybe we should call it the Prelats Altar. 
So that yeah. that's really it. It's it's now it's it's the Volk, Volk's altar. It's the people's altar. That's what they genuinely call it. That's what they call it. Yeah, and, and it's such a. It's like everything else. It's one of the stupidest, worst lies imaginable. Mm -hmm. See this, you know. I I try to maintain a um, I try to maintain a good sense of humor about this, but you know there was so much of it and so unrelenting. And so stupid. Uh, it, if I think, if I allow myself to think too much about it, I get extremely angry. Because mm -hmm. uh, and it never stops. You know, to this day, right? Uh, that generation of clerics who are now at the very top of the church, uh, uh, because of their age and all. I mean, it had to happen. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But they were such a wretched bunch, just wretched. The, the folk in charge now are the, are the people who, when I was young, were not the initiators of this stuff, but they were the henchmen. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they never had answers, or if they did, they were stupid and self-contradictory. You know, well, we're doing it for the people. Well, yeah, but Father, the people don't want it. Well, they should obey. <laughs> well, hold on, Father, which is it? You know, what are you saying? Which of your mouths are you talking out of? Is it something the people want, which I can prove to you isn't true? Or is it something ordered from Rome, which I can prove to you isn't true? Which lie are you using now? But I was, there's an article. Um, it's a, it's, and it talks about how the Diocese of Pittsburgh is reorganizing as many dioceses I want to do. Uh, that from 1980 to the modern era, there's been a 50% slash in mass attendance and in, in, in Catholic school attendance and all that kind of stuff. And how they essentially want to start a process of merging parishes uh, down to 25% of what they have currently. So they went from like 107 down to 81 or something like that currently. And from there, they just kind of keep going. Um, and it's funny that you say that because you see these old churches and you see the communities that these churches brought around. And it seems like how the recovations happened. It seems like how the liturgical changes happened was you did have the henchmen who dogmatically said, this is my way or the highway. You have the nuns yeah. line you up and say, accept it, like, like it or lump it. Um, yeah. And then we are, you know, we're the heirs of, of those, that turmoil. And uh, Rudy, you can definitely speak to this, but you know, our last episode was on a uh, he sh that shall not be named, which was about Lefebvre and society and what the church says and also what what the situation has been post all that tumult. Um, Rudy's uh, reading uh, an open letter to confuse Catholics and I accuse the council and a couple other kind of gems. So it's kind of funny just seeing that we've been told our entire lives that these changes were from the for the people by the people this humanistic change into the mass that if you dissent from female altar servers or if you dissent from uh eucharistic ministers or anything like that that the problem or if you think that traditional architecture is great that the problem really is you it's not your soul reacting to the good the true and the beautiful but the problem is that your your rigid ways and my final thing is that uh Father James Martin put out a tweet recently, and I'm supposed to check if it's completely true, but at this point, I don't deny it. But he said, if you don't like, mo not modern, but modernist architecture, uh, some people do. So more or less just, you know, suck it up, buttercup. And Really? Which for him to say would be very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing is, Father James Martin can put his, face, his mouth into neutral and let it run forever. But Orthodox priests have to constantly look over their shoulders and fear uh, over their mitered masters. Well, you know, no, no, that's not on, my lords. No, no, no. You have shown us over the course of the COVID uh, nonsense that you have no regard, most of you. There are honor, honorable exceptions. I'll be the first to point that out. But most of you, have no care for the salvation of souls. It's a meaningless term to you. It's all about power and money and promoting your little friends. Well, no, you're in charge. You've got the power. You can do whatever the devil you like, and you do, but don't expect to be paid for it. 
And you want to know something else, my little mitered munchkins? You're the past. You're elderly. You're ridiculous. Everybody knows it. And the only ones who don't are you. And even you know it too, which is why you get so angry. I know you get annoyed at the younger priests. I know you get annoyed at the younger laymen. I know you go, oh, they're so rigid, they're awful. Why can't the way, they be the way we were in 1968? Well, my darlings, it's because it is no longer 1968. And I understand. I share your pain. I remember 68. I remember when you people felt alive. Well, you're not alive now. You were spiritually dead then. You're almost physically dead now. And in the immortal words of the times, they are changing. <laughs> Get out of the way if you can't lend a hand. You know, the late lamented Father Richard McBrien used to have a column in the tithings, our archdiocesan paper, under uh, Cardinal Mahoney, he who must be obeyed. And he ran a rip-roaring uh, column attacking the young priests. Oh, he was so upset. They don't understand what we did for them. Well, it's one of the four or five times in my life I have written a fan letter. And I said, dear Reverend Father, I understand how you feel. I too remember the 60s. I get it. But you've got to understand that your day and your way have passed. Let me make this clear to you in words I'm sure you'll understand. And I enclosed a couple of stanzas of the times they are changing. Oh, his response. Oh, heavens to Murgatroyd, was he upset with me? This is terrible. You're taking a song that was an anthem for my generation. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, blah. boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Very upset. Wow. Ooh. And I, I answered back. Oh, I'm very sorry, Vanya. I'm sure that change of life is a difficult thing to go through. <laughs> Roasted. No, sympathetic. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Listen, I'm old too. I get it. I understand where they're coming from. I've got one foot in the grave. More yesterdays than tomorrows. I know where they are. I get that. But you know, I'll tell you something funny about age mm -hmm. truth, and the principles that do not change. The age is no surprise and no shock and no horror. It's part of the whole cycle of things. It's like the liturgical year that goes round and round. Uh, one day in the not too distant future, in 10 years or 20 or 30, which to me is not a long time anymore because, you know, it's not a long time. Uh, please God, I'll be laid next to my father's in Notre Dame Cemetery in Fall River, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I know that. And so the best thing I can do with the rest of my life is give a steady witness to the principles I've tried to keep since. But if my principles are based upon the latest thing, I'm being with it. And my sense of being with it is trapped in the 60s. Instead of being perennial, I become a museum piece and very resentful. And anything that implies Otherwise, well, I mean, this is what I tell younger priests when they when they get uh, when they get over upset and overwrought about the treatment they get from the older clergy. I say, you've got to understand, Father, it's not you; it's what you stand for. By believing as you believe and doing as you do, you're unwittingly and unconsciously telling them that their lives were useless. And that everything they've done was a worthless exercise. And I certainly wouldn't. So you've got to understand, and they, it's not a rational or thought out thing on their part. It's purely emotional. 
but they can't think it out because if they did, they'd have to question. And how do you begin to question a whole lifetime spent wrong? Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't do that. So I've always urged the younger priests I know to try to understand and not to hate. Because, you know, from the top on down, these guys are all shuffling toward the grave. And they have, uh, and most of them are closer to it than I am, just in terms of years. So I do appreciate, and I'm not being funny or ironic, I do appreciate where they're coming from. I mean, the difference, of course, is that I have no control or responsibility over anything. Mm -hmm. They do. And they'll be held to account for souls in a way no layman will be. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard. That's very hard. I certainly, I certainly, frankly, well, how do I put this? You know, God does, God wishes that the sinner should live and not die. Mm -hmm. And I certainly wish that these elderly people would revert to the faith of their childhood. Uh, but you know, that in itself is a phrase that would annoy them. I remember when they were pushing communion in the hand back in the 70s. One of the arguments they used was that it's a more adult way of receiving communion. And when I heard that, my first thought was, um, and unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. that, that hit me immediately. So both my laughter and my scorn are ways of dealing with a horrendous situation. But at the end of the day, we do have to try to have some compassion for the people who put us in it. Because it's not like they did themselves any good. Cromwell and Cranmer did not benefit from the destruction they wrought. And if somehow they could have been saved at the last minute, what a victory over the devil that would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt it happened, but it would have been a tremendous victory. This is, um, this is, yeah, this is one of the things that for us and especially the way that we've kind of based our charism, not just here on the show with Glad Trad Podcast, but just our lives in general. One of the great kind of disappointments is that God's truth and how he expresses that truth in the end, even when it seems darkest before the dawn always comes out. And so now, you know, we didn't live through the changes, but what's nice is that, um, you know, Latin mass is accessible, normally accessible. And it's not just the mass, yeah. but traditional Catholic culture. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that one, yeah. one thing that's so interesting about reading through, um, whether it's these articles from the early 2000s or stuff before, is the talk of the indult mass and the scattering of the four winds that they deliberately did to traditional Catholicism. Putting the Orthodox priest out into the sticks. Um, Father Friar at St. At, um, at Vitus talks about getting on a train is it Rudy and going four hours out yeah, to a barn? He was in, um, in Australia, he would take yeah. like a, almost a whole day's worth of, of travel to get to the parish um, to do uh, to go to a Latin mass in a barn just in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's that's the way it was. And of course, Common. it, it uh, you know, when I was a teenager, there was no readily accessible Tridentine mass at all in the LA area. Mm. Uh, there wasn't the SSPX. There was nothing. Um, then there was a uh, an ex Jesuit priest, German name, uh, it, it escapes me, but he is the ultimate father of Our of Perpetual Help, the chapel at Garden Grove. I can't think of his name. Uh, but he was an ex Jesuit. Uh, he started I think saying. I know who you're mass. talking about. That's, um, that's the independent church, right? It sure is. Yeah. Uh, other, uh, I, can't, I can't even. I know. I know these names as well as my own. But you know how it is. You stay away from LA for two years. You forget <laughs> about it completely. Yeah. But yeah. Suffice to say that I mean I've given a lecture at the place, but and it's it's a beautiful church, but it's the descendant of the ultimate descendant of this thing going that was going on in the San Fernando Valley, and for a while they ended up with a school of just called Our Lady of Victory. Uh, but it all started out with this uh, 
Jesuit or ex-Jesuit priest offering uh, mass in the Holiday Inn. And then there was uh, Monsignor Donahue uh, who came out to Arcadia. He was kind of an odd guy. Ultimately, he wouldn't let you go to the, he wouldn't let you receive if you weren't a registered member of his chapel. Oh, it's like a pious of faith. Which, well, a long story there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then of course, Cardinal McIntyre was offering the Latin Mass at a side altar every weekday. But there was, he didn't even give out communion. You know, it was, it was the lowest of low Masses. Hence my being sent off to uh, St. Mary's. You know, I can remember when I was going from Adel to a day, uh, the, uh, the first of the two Catholic scouting awards. Well, the second of the Catholic Kemp scouting award before Lily died. But anyway, uh, I can remember asking about the monstrance, and I, I hadn't seen benediction since my early childhood. And the, the Jesuit in charge told me that benediction and the monstrance had been abolished. Now, not only was that not true, but you you may have not that easy a time getting Latin masses today, but you can certainly get to adoration, which has exploded, and you can get to benedictions. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the few really good things to come out of the past several decades, other than the than the expansion of the uh, the availability of the Trinity Mass has been the explosion of perpetual adoration. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you, you really, if all else fails, you've got that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's no small thing. Also, you know, I like to point out to people, when I, uh, when I wrote my uh, book on the Holy Grail, I did a lot of uh, research on the Eucharistic miracles over the past 25 years, the last the six. And amongst other interesting things about them, and they're they're very strange. I mean, each of them are just weird. Scientifically speaking, I'm talking about. You know, the one of the very smart things the church does is they'll send samples of this stuff to uh, labs without telling them what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the standard thing. They, they never tell them what it is they've got, uh, and. <laughs> And very often what they've got is simply impossible. One of them, I forget which one, but the bread turned partially to human flesh, but one section of it is sort of candy cane, bread and heart tissue. You know, you can't do that. It doesn't, it, there's no way to do it. You, you can't candy cane it like that, <clears throat> but there it is. So anyway, the reason why I mention this, all of those miracles occurred at Novus Ordo Masses. Mm -hmm. And, I mentioned this, and it's an important point to make. Much as I prefer uh, the Trinity Mass, and not, mind you, for aesthetic reasons, but because I believe textually and all that, it far better and far more clearly presents what the church teaches is going on, which is the only objective way you can evaluate any liturgical rite. How well does it express what the church says is going on? Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, if you look at the Byzantine rite, you look at the Maronite, the, the Chaldean, the Coptic, etc., they all do it very differently, but they all, they all express very clearly the church's teaching on sacrifice and the real presence. Yeah. You can't come away from any of them without knowing something weird has just gone on. Right. And that, that is the problem with the Novus Ordo, is that it doesn't express it so clearly. It can, if you know what you're doing. But very often it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So these are fine distinctions that have to be made. But I say all this because all that aside, that's where the Eucharistic miracles occurred. And this is why, much as I prefer the Trinitine Mass and much as I wish the Novus Ordo would slowly fade away, uh, the advice that some people give of, oh, well, if you can't go to a traditional Mass, don't go to Mass at all. Stay home and read your missile. Well, how is that different from your bishop saying, just make a perfect act of contrition and a spiritual communion? How different is that? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I think that we trans tend to forget is the old adage, never make the perfect the enemy of the good. 
Mm. And that that's why, as I say, I'm I'm happy at least perpetual adoration has exploded in numbers. Uh, I uh, I made the comment in the book, and I'll I'll make it now, that in a real sense, uh, a perpetual adoration chapel is sort of a chapel of the Grail all on its own, because of course it was the contents of the Grail that made the Grail holy, not not the thing itself. Yeah. And you know, you, you on the one hand, you don't want to lose sight of perfection because you want to keep striving for it. But as I say, on the other hand, you don't want to lose whatever good is around simply because it isn't perfect. And these silly and charivitous, you know, and that's so often the case in our Catholic life. Uh, despair and presumption. <laughs> uh, feast and fast. Yeah. You know, it, 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 we always have to keep all of these things sort of in creative tension with each other. Right. And um, I think you'll have noticed in my, in my uh, Roman Catholics, when there were good elements, I pointed them out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't, uh, I did my best to, to report the way things were, which were a very mixed bag. And I mean, sometimes you get a really badly done mass and a really good sermon. Yeah. Or a really well done mass and an awful song. Or terrible hymns and very and a very reverent performance by the priest. Or sloppy priest, but incredibly beautiful hymns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it... it <laughs> Uh, I, I must say that, that uh, in all the years that I did that, though, um, see, I would always do it on the third mm -hmm. Sunday because the other three Sundays were the end all mass. Mm -hmm. So when the paper came to an end, what I did, because uh, I still had that third Sunday with no end all mass, what I did was I would go to a different Eastern Rite every Sunday that I had not been to before. And in Los Angeles, you've got them all. Yeah. So I did them all. Armenian, uh, Coptic, Chaldean, Syriac, uh, Ethiopian, uh, Malankaris, Malabaris. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I, I do think that's important to breed within ourselves a sort of pan-Catholic identity. I did one of my earlier articles for it that I did was a piece on the ethnic parishes of the Latin Rite in Los Angeles. And that was a fun article. Mm. Poles, Lithuanians, Croatians, Chinese, Japanese. I, it, was, it was wonderful. And that, uh, how do I put it? There is a real, a, a real and true and proper diversity within the Catholic Church. And we have to avoid losing sight of that. Uh, we have to avoid exaggerating it to the point where everything is so everything is so different, nothing means anything. But we can't, uh, again, you've got the, the two extremes to avoid. I, um, I'll tell you a funny story, speaking though of, of trads in that era. A friend of mine was going to get married. Now, <laughs> We had a, a mutual friend who's an organist, uh, uh, a, uh, a choir master and all that stuff, very traditionally minded. And he had read St. Pius X's Modu Proprio on, uh, on uh, church music. So our friend who was getting married asked him to arrange the music for the wedding, which he was very happy to do. But it gave him a bit of a problem because he couldn't use Here Comes the Bride and the Wedding March. Mm -hmm. Since if you follow the motu proprio of St. Pius X, those are of theatrical origins that can't be used. All right. Well, <laughs> okay. he went to yet another mutual friend, a lady that we knew who had been a choir mistress of many choirs before Vatican II. And he goes to her and he says, you know, her name, um, I've got to do the the, uh, the music for Blank's wedding. Uh, what, did, what, was, what did you use for the recessional and the processional 
before Vatican II with the weddings you did. And she said, oh, the wedding march, and uh, here comes the bride. Yeah. <laughs> and my, uh, my friend says, well, you know, I don't think so-and-so really wants those. He didn't want to get into it over the motor program. Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, that's so-and-so. He is so no sort of. <laughs> mm. Same energy. <laughs> uh, and and you know, of course, to be to be honest with her, and I've known other people like this. No Soto came to mean anything he didn't like, mm. and she was actually heard to exclaim, "Oh, those Mormons! They're so No Soto." <laughs> I'll, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you use no sort of for anything you don't like, mm -hmm. you know? Gosh, I hate getting up in the morning. It is so no sort of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you misuse the words, they, they come to mean nothing at all, um, which means you can use them for anything you want. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, excuse me, um, could you could you add a little more sugar to this? It's kind of no soda. <laughs> <laughs> that feels so funny as though something like that makes sense to me. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like I feel I don't know. The movie was I don't know. Just kind of just got a little nervous, Ordo. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure you want to go out in that dress? It looks kind of I don't know. No soda. Oh, oh, oh. See that one works though. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> <laughs> that one works. Do you, do you like the, the haircut? I'm afraid it, it's a little over sort of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no. Very, very 20th century trap. <laughs> what's funny, what's funny in all of this is that you know, you get the sense that like I've always said this, especially with regards to the new mass, it's it's not even, you know, of course it's it's the ritualism, the, the things that, that, that has been holding the church and suddenly were torn away. But it's a fact that there's an entire philosophy shift. And I was, and that philosophy shift is obviously bore rotten fruit because of the amount of hemorrhage and things. But there are things that if we heard in the Latin mass, I think of this with changing the words, right? Like no priest in the middle of Latin mass, if, a lot, if you're you know, at a Trinity mass and the priest suddenly you know, start speaking English or something, everyone would be like, whoa, you know, the words of consecration, because Latin's a dead language, because it doesn't move, it's easier just to say the black and do the red. Yeah, because it's yeah. just right there. And you have you have a little section here again from um from Precious Blood Church that I've that has really been thinking of. And it's during the homily of the priest there, his father Brogan. It's a very pretty church. So he's an example of great architecture garbage homily um and he starts by pointing to uh how the altar has candles and he says how you won't see that in churches anymore insurance companies won't let most parishes have them but candles lend an atmosphere they're comforting they set the tone for any gatherings you might have especially scented ones now you might give a candle as a gift but you wouldn't give a light bulb no you wouldn't hear about someone giving a friend a box of 100 watt light bulbs but you'd give a candle, wouldn't you? Sure you would. And I can I know exactly the kind of cadence that a priest with this sort of with this sort of homily has. I can I can hear my mind. And then he gets to this. But candles don't give out as bright of a light as light bulbs, do they? No, they don't. But they don't have the indescribable something that candlelight has. It is a special relationship. And that is what the persons of the Trinity have. And you now, after this prelude, realize that rather than going in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Holy Trinity is a unique personhood of God and all that kind of stuff. You just, you have to start with this whole cadence of light bulbs. And he goes, um, um, these are, oh, 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 here we go. Okay. Um, you'll notice that we have ribbons all around. So these must be banners. They're representing the Trinity. Uh, gold is for the Father, purple for the Son, and white for the Holy Spirit. But you know, many people don't have fathers. And so calling God Father is not an effective way of representing God to them. And many people don't have male offspring. So the Son doesn't make much sense to them. And the Spirit, well, what's a spirit anyway? Perhaps a more effective way to view the Trinity, Father Brogan suggested, is as creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. 
These are not static terms like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Rather, they speak of a God who is active and they bring us into relationship of the Trinity. After all, we all have to create ourselves whenever we make changes to our lives and we redeem ourselves when we have fallen into things we should not do or do not want to do. And we can sanctify ourselves through prayer and the sacraments. So we are linked to the work of the Trinity in our lives. We might say this new way of talk is more helpful in our lives. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that occasion very well, Sam. I don't remember them all, but that one I do remember. That left, uh, you see, I got my Eagle Scout at Precious Blood Church. Mm. Year old Troop 810. Uh, 1977, not that we're counting. Um, and, uh, and it's a very beautiful church. It's one of my favorites in the Los Angeles area. So to hear that utter drivel pour out of his mouth was painful. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, it's been taken over since by a Filipino religious order who I don't think are as crazy as this guy was. But uh, it, that the, the, what you heard there was very typical of that era, of that time. There was, there was a whole movement to replace Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with that uh, creator. Uh, sanctifier, redeemer. Sanctifier, redeemer sanctifier, yeah. Ugh. Whatever. It, it, you know, which, which struck me as very much uh, like uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. But, you know, I, I, I just... In looking back, uh, it, things are actually a lot better on the local scene in a lot of ways, in a lot of places, than they were for most of my life. Mm. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, when my father died, for instance, in 1996, uh, I basically had to hold guns to priests' heads to have them wear black vestments of the Nova Soda, which I supplied. You know, they didn't want to do it. And my, because uh, we had to do two masses on two coasts, um, you know, one in LA and then back home yeah. uh, before the barrel. And I basically said in both cases, well, you know what, Father, you do what you want, uh, but if you want to get paid, you wear these vestments. Otherwise, you're doing it for free and no stipend, which has always been my ultimate threat whenever there's been a creative difference between the cleric and myself over what was going to be done, I would always say, well, it's up to you whether or not you'll be paid, I mean. And that, you know, when they see you may you mean it and you're not being funny, then generally the, then they'll laugh as though you were being funny to save face mm -hmm. and you get what you want. Uh, the, um, but when mother died in 2015, Parish churches on both coasts, solemn high requiems. And that was the difference between 1996 and 2015. Uh, and the traditional rites of burial at, uh, at the grave. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I have to remind people of when they get very excited about what's coming out of Rome is that when I was young, it was the reverse. You would get good stuff out of Rome and uh, bupkis in your local environment. And that, I don't say it's better, but it's certainly more pleasant. Uh, mutatis mutandis, you know, uh, the, if you're in a setup now where you can get a, a private mass while all the others around you are shut down, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you, you, you can't really complain too much. Uh, but no, I, I the, uh, unfortunately, nothing is perfect and never will be in this life. But mm -hmm. things can be better, and in a lot of ways, they are better than what I saw. The problem, as I say, is that since uh, Pope Benedict left us, uh, we have been dominated by the generation of clerics that were the henchmen. Mm -hmm. But because they're at the top, they no longer have the same, they can mess with things in a certain way. They couldn't then, but they can't mess with other things. Things that are close to hand, you say. Uh, the bishop is not going to come. In me, I mean, he might fire your pastor if he's too Catholic. But in terms of, uh, 
of coming to your, you know, your mom's requiem, say, and, and messing it up. He can't. I had a, a very funny experience maybe 10 years ago when Father Johnson, the uh, late pastor of St. Mary's by the Sea in Huntington Beach, died. Now, he, uh, the bishop was Bishop uh, Brown, uh, who was nicknamed when he was in his prior diocese in Boise, Idaho. They called him Close Him Down Brown because of his uh, love of closing parishes. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, you know, it's an acquired taste, I guess, a hobby for some. But um, he had to sit through a requiem mass for Bishop Johnson. Well, <laughs> he had to kneel to receive communion on the tongue. <laughs> I, I felt so badly for him. I really did. The poor little tot. But the fun part came at the end. He couldn't restrain himself. So as they were about to process out, he jumps up and says, oh, Father Johnson's in heaven, blah, 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 blah. And the problem, of course, with that is that everybody knew that if that's true, it's because Brown had made his life a hell on earth. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Norbertine who offered the mass, when the bishop finished, said, of course, we, do, we don't know where Father Johnson's soul is, which is why we have to pray for its repose. <laughs> God bless Ooh. him. <laughs> yeah, that's, a big, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Um, and it's, it's sort of developed recently is when people say, oh, well, he's in heaven now or she's in heaven. She's in a better place. Uh, you hear about this a lot in music, actually. Um, yeah. Some artists will sing about this sort of thing. But I, it really bothers me because it's a disservice to the, the person who died. You know? Yeah. They're forgotten oh. forever. You know, you never pray for them. And who knows? They might be suffering. They might well be suffering. And, yeah. you know, it... it um, is with, is one of the, uh, we have it's the Confraternity of the Precious Blood of somebody, one of the many prayer books that are out. And there's a section in praying for the souls in purgatory and a mention of the fact that, uh, you know, I myself might have contributed to their being in purgatory now. Mm. You know, for some, you know, some collusion and sin or, or whatever. Um, I, I myself might have a part in what they're going through, which makes it all the more important for me to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And we forget that. Uh, I think it's, the, the particular prayer I'm thinking of has the refrain, you at least, my friend. You at least would pray for me. And of course we don't. Uh, and that's why we you know, just left the month of the Holy Souls, uh, which is also my birth month, not that I'm trying to oh, garner attention. Well, happy belated birthday. Thank you so much. And not that that's what I'm trying to get out of everyone at mm. 60. <laughs> now that I've now that I've turned the big 6-0 last month that no one See, remembered. I, I told you I would send you Marilyn Monroe. I told you. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I sent it in tweet form though. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but but seriously, uh, we we the Holy Souls are another thing that have gone out of uh, out of modern thought. Even a lot of trans don't think that much about them. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you know, life being what it is, we doubtless have a lot of beloved friends and relations among them, uh, if they were fortunate. <laughs> so um, we need to remember to pray for them. And uh, another, um, this is an, I'm a little bit on random sort right now, but there it is. It's late in the day for me. Mm -hmm. uh, December, of course, is the month of the Immaculate Conception. December the 8th is the feast thereof. And it, it, we, one thing we should remember is that that's the patronal festival of the United States. And more than the 4th of July, it's our national day. And if ever there was a time when our country needs prayers and love and affection, it's right now. So I would urge your listeners when the on Tuesday uh, go to mass if you if, if the masses are permitted by your, your Lord and Master, um, go to mass, pray very strongly for the uh, for the United States. 
they're going through a very difficult time right now, uh, as you know. There's no matter how things end up playing, half the population are going to think the president uh, is legitimate. Yeah. Beyond a shadow of a doubt that they'll think that. Whether or not it's true, who knows? I don't know. But this is what at least half the population are going to think, whomever is sitting in the White House in January. Uh, these are not good times in the United States. So we really need to pray very hard to, to Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception that uh, somehow both our leaders, our fellow citizens, and ourselves uh, acquire some sort of brains. Be nice. What, uh, what I think is, you know, we are all supposed to, one thing that's, that's, that I, I really ruminate on is how we think that things happen in the past and that they just stay in the past and that there are no cycles of anything. So um, yeah. war is a succession, right? That's, or, or civil war or strife or any sort of turmoil, all of it all blows over. Those were our ancestors who didn't know anything, who were primitive, barbaric. Uh, they were not at their time the pinnacle of like civilization as it is. They're just, you know, it's dead in the past, but we've evolved past that. Uh, what I think with the papacy, um, bad popes only supposed to be something from the Renaissance or the pornocracy in the Middle Ages or maybe the Aryan heresy. But, you know, nowadays we've, we've evolved much past that. We're, we're simply yeah, too yeah. wise and too... And I am grateful for, for our trials as we ought to be as, as good Christians, grateful for our, our joys and our failings um, because it's all demonstrations of our, of our human falling and our frailties and how the moment we get too big for our britches, it seems like Our Lady smacks us back down again. That God goes, "Oh, really? Okay. Well, let's see if you can. Let's see if that's true or that's not true." Um, yeah, and and, uh, and as as it says in the Bible, nothing is true under the, nothing is new rather. Nothing is true. <laughs> nothing is new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Modernist nothing confirmed. Is, yeah, that's right, Charles. Is, you heretic. <laughs> nothing is true under the sun. I like that. <laughs> you know, it's, Very sixty. It's like the. Well, so no, it's, it's like, <laughs> no, it's it's like the senator you know, who is who is fate, who is being questioned by the senatorial commission, and uh, he says, "Well, gentlemen, as it says in the Holy Bible, what is truth?" Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus wept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we can always, we can, when, when picking and choosing gets, goes really bad. <laughs> <laughs> the devil may quote scripture. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, gentlemen. Um, you know, but at the same time, we've got to be of good cheer. I mean, I remember the 60s very, very well, the time when our current leadership in the church felt alive. And they were terrible times in a lot of ways. I mean, um, I'm not one of these people who idolizes the 50s. And, and, and don't kid yourself, the 50s ran on to 1966 or 7. <laughs> but, uh, and, but to make up for it, the 60s lasted until today. But at any rate, the, uh, the thing about the, the 50s is that they were the, uh, you might say, an earlier stage of the disease. Uh, and my, my little joke, you know, when you're in the tertiary stage of syphilis, the primary stage looks a lot better. You just had the odd headache, you know, or fever, as opposed to chunks falling off of your face. This isn't from experience, um, God willing. Uh, with any, well, no, I, I'm not taking it from personal experience. No. Personal <laughs> no, this Actually, this part's entirely artificial. Look. <laughs> yeah. but, <laughs> that, now, that would be something to see. But seriously, uh, so, you know, we, again, we have to maintain a balance between uh, uh, figuring everything is everything we need to worry and, oh, my heavens, the sky is falling. Mm hmm you know, the, the, the truth is we do have to operate. It is difficult. It is unpleasant. It is problematic on the one hand. And yet on the other hand, there are always sources of joy and sources of hope. And if I've gotten all calendrical on you by talking about the holy souls and the American conception, we are in Advent. 
and Christmas is coming. Mm -hmm. And Christmas, regardless of how you find yourself celebrating it, if you let it, it will bring you new hope. It'll revive you. It'll, uh, regardless of what restrictions are going on. I remember the first Christmas I ever spent away from home. It was Christmas of 83. And I was very, very unhappy about that. Um, and the prospect of spending it alone loomed up in front of me. And I, I wasn't happy. When I was in my club, the late lamented Masters Club in uh, Hollywood, I had very little money at that time. And that wasn't much fun either. But I'm sitting there, I'm drinking some port. And port, to me, has always been a very Christmassy drink. Mm. So this is about a week before Christmas, maybe a little less. I'm drinking port, and I'm looking at the beautiful decorations in the bar of the club. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's still going to be Christmas. Wherever I find myself, whatever I'm doing, it'll still be Christmas. And as it happened, the night of the 23rd that year, the club was rented out to some private organization for a, a Christmas party. But the uh, uh, business that we normally hired to uh, supply a hat check girl, for whatever reason, they, could, they couldn't or wouldn't or didn't show. So the club manager very apologetically asked me if I would mind doing the honors. And then he said, as a laughing afterthought, of course, you can keep any tips you might make. <laughs> <laughs> little, little did he know. Little did he know. So I played hat check lab. And I uh, made something like $150 in tips. Which I then went out the next day. And I blew all but three bucks of it on gifts. Because, you know, I thought I was just going to be able to get people uh, hearty handshakes and, uh, you know, healthy hugs. <laughs> but instead, I was able to buy, uh, admittedly, cheapish gifts for everybody. And then I gave the last three bucks I had from that stash to a bomb on Hollywood Boulevard. And I ended up spending, I went to Midnight Mass in Blessed Sacrament. Hmm. Uh, and then I went out with some friends until the wee hours. Overnight at another friend's place, and then we went to uh, in the morning. A bunch of us went to see "To Be or Not to Be" the movie with No Brooks, and then we had dinner at the late lamented Michaels on uh, on Las Vegas, and it was a wonderful Christmas dinner. Now I mention this because a lot of our viewers, especially because of the COVID and other things, will not be able to do as I will not be able to do what we would normally do for Christmas. Mm. Don't let it bother you, because really, it's not primarily about repeating what we've always done or conjuring up our sentimental feelings, important as those, th as those things are, and they are important. It is about celebrating the birth of Christ and about remembering that it's not simply an event that happened a long time ago, but something that continues to happen. Really, we don't want to say Christmas was, we have to say Christmas is. And if there's anything I would hope that our viewers take away with them from this uh, podcast, it is that at the end of the day, Christmas and the other feasts of the year come every year to renew our hope and our charity and our faith. Um, as uh, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, he puts it, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. In this world or the next. So, nothing I've seen in my 60 years of life has been able to contradict that. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, I was there when things went crazy. I was there when they got a little saner. I was there when they went crazy again. But at the end of the day, these are only the historical background against which we each of us have to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. God knew from all eternity that this was the time that you and I would be best able to save our souls. And that's why we're here.
not so I went now. But my father used to say that, but then he looked at me and he'd say, of course, on the other hand, considering how screwy the president is, he doesn't really speak very well of you and me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you know, there's the, the old line, the only ones I trust are thee and me, and every now and then I wonder about thee. <laughs> yeah. Well, he would repeat that, and then he'd add, but you know, sometimes I'm not really sure about me. <laughs> I the more uh, the more I hear about, especially your dad and your mom and. It lies, you know, it's funny because you can see what mannerisms we all get from our parents, you know, and how it kind of grows in. So it's, I can I can see the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree uh, as far as clones are concerned. Not really. Uh, when I was back home last Christmas, the last time I was home. No, no, please don't cry for me, Argentina. Yeah. Anyway, uh, no, the last time I was home was last Christmas. And... Uh, uh, my brother and I went out with an old friend and we were laughing and joking and yes, drinking. It wasn't Musso and Frank's, since you asked. Um, but finally, our friend looks at us and says, can either of you two go more than an hour without quoting your father? And then Andre and I looked at each other and we started laughing. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't actually, but thanks for asking. Right. And, uh, our, our mother was an endless source of quotable quotes as well. So, uh, you know, and, and as you can imagine with the, the coming of Christmas, you miss the loved ones that you won't see again this side of the grave. And the prospect of leaving this life, I think, becomes progressively less difficult mm -hmm. as the other side offers more and more of the people you knew. You hope in heaven or at least in purgatory. When you're younger and things change, you have a feeling that, well, maybe somehow things will get back to where they were. As you get older, you learn they never do. It doesn't mean that there might not be better times. It doesn't mean there might not be triumphant times, great times. But once the thing passes, it's past. You know, in the words of the, that great theologian, Perry Como. <laughs> in a second. Uh, once upon a time, somehow never comes again. Mm. But you have other times, you have different times. And I wish, um, as I've told my classmates here, I'll tell you, Lance, especially at this time of year, you, you have no idea how much I wish you all a very good and happy time. You have no idea how much, how well I wish for you. Uh, I certainly have seen the alternatives of horror. I hope that you all never see that. I hope that, I know that can't be because that's not the way life is. But I hope that your lives are filled with endless and easy triumphs and uh, endless good times. It won't be that way, but it doesn't keep me from hoping. <laughs> well, you know, we, we certainly wish the same for you and, and for all of our viewers and for our, certainly our families. And it's, it, it might look dark at times, and we certainly know that. And... I have a little ad sometimes where I say, you know, things get worse before they get better, but they do get better. Um, they do. That's precisely. They do get better, and the light shines in the darkness, even if the darkness doesn't comprehend it. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. You know what you were talking about earlier, Charles, reminded me of something that that a, a friend who I admire a lot mentioned one day, and I don't, I don't think he. Um, meant it to be anything profound. I, I think actually he was joking, but um, it resonated with me. And he said in response to uh, some new scandalous thing that Pope Francis said, he said, you know what? I am just a peasant. I'm just going to live out my life like a peasant in the medieval time. Oh. 
And um, gonna, I don't know who the Pope is. I'm just going to work out my own sanctification. And that really stuck out to me as something that I needed to hear at that moment because um, Jordan and I and a lot of our other friends too are just kind of struggling, trying to make sense of the, the time. And uh, it really just boils down to the sanctification of your own soul. Like that's what you have to worry about the most. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's the thing outside of you. And that's the thing that you can affect. I mean, you realize that whether you had the best Pope or the worst Pope in the world, you have no effect over that. Mm-hmm. You're not wearing a red hat. Uh, you really have no effect even over your own Bishop, unless you've got money. Mm-hmm. So uh, you've got some effect over your priest if he's sympathetic. And if he's not, he has no reason to listen to you unless you've got money. Uh, but you can control you. And to put this in a sort of somewhat different context, but connected, as my late father used to say, you cannot control anyone else in the world. All you can be is the kind of man, the kind of gentleman that you wish everyone else was. That you can do, that you have power over. You know, your, your, your kingdom is bounded by your body and your four walls. And that within those walls, you can do what you want. You know, you can, you can say your rosary as often as you like. If you've, got a, uh, if you've got a perpetual adoration chapel somewhere in here, you can go to it. You know, you, you, whatever masses are available, you can choose. You have that power. You can pray as much as you want. No one can stop you from praying. Not even the bishop. <laughs> um, I forbid all private prayer in this diocese. I'm giving you an indult. You don't have to pray anymore, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an injunction. You are not permitted to pray. Oh, yes. God will not hear your prayers by my order. <laughs> uh, you know, Your Excellency, I think you're a little crazy. <laughs> Ultra Vire. <laughs> yes, very Ultra Vire is that man. That they don't got no power to do nothing like that. So, uh, I, uh, anyway. I don't know, Bishop. That's a little. That's a little Nova Sordo for me. Uh, it's a little <laughs> Uber. <laughs> You're just a little too Nova Soto right now, your elegance. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that, of course, was the, uh, it reminds me, apropos of nothing in particular, but years ago, Cardinal uh, O'Connell, who was the, uh, the Archbishop of Boston before Cardinal Cushing, went out to a Polish parish in the countryside of Massachusetts. No. And he was a very grandiloquent kind of person. Uh, very strange in his way. But the uh, the Polish priest was standing there with him, and these two old Polish ladies were talking, obviously, about him. Now, he was kind of a porcine-looking fellow. And so one of the uh, one of the two Polish ladies, the two elderly Polish ladies, says to the other one in Polish, he's got the face of a pig. <laughs> and the, the archbishop... The cardinal asks the priest, what did she say? He says, uh, she says, your evidence has the face of an angel. And he says, ah, the simple faith of these dear peasant people. Oh, my. <laughs> 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 which, which cardinal was this? That's O'Connell of Boston. Cardinal O'Connell. Yeah, he, he really did look like a pig, to be honest with you, but... Oh, that's fun. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, he, he had issues. He uh, he had brought over from Japan a houseboy whom he allowed to uh, venerate an idol in the uh, Episcopal residence. Well, it so happened that he had a nephew, Monsignor O'Connell, who was a uh, was his secretary and the priest. But he also, but Senior had a wife in New York, a Jewish lady, and he would go down to stay with her every weekend. But this is back in the teens and twenties, you know, mm-hmm. this is a little while ago. Well, Wait, he was married? Uh-huh. Not in the eyes of the church, obviously. Oh. 
Oh, <laughs> but you see, he had blackmail on his uncle. Hmm. So, uh, but Rome eventually found out. So uh, they forced O'Connell to lay aside as his nephew. And uh, that was that. But uh, nothing is new under the sun. And the Boston Archdiocese has always had a problem with its prelates. Heard that before, yeah. I've heard that before. Damn. Charles, uh, there is the best part about having you on is that we always want to have you back. So you will have to do another episode with us. You know, um, it is, we still, we will kidnap you. We will, we will drag you back to the States just in time for the strife if it takes us to do that. Um, but for, for our audience's purposes, where is the best place for your wonderful array of writings, whether that is in article form or in book form? Well, if you go to Tumblr House, they have a huge collection of links to my uh, posted material. Uh, and they sell all of my books. Uh, you can also go to TAM for my two latest books. Uh, if you live outside the United States, and I'm afraid you're stuck with Amazon. Uh, let me see what else can I tell you. Of course, there's my regular Monday podcast, which I'm going to have to record later this evening. Oh, yeah. Off the menu. Mm -hmm. um, and let me see what else can I say. I, uh, you know, I've been on, on a lot of census fidelium. I've been on, on, especially since the lockdown, I've been on a ton of guests. Yes, podcasting. Uh, well, you know, people don't have much else to do, so yeah, I, so you might as well talk to you. Whatever. <laughs> no, you know, you're bored. Mm -hmm. It's listen. If you can't get the first, second, third tier of celebrities, you go for what's left. <laughs> oh wow! No, never mind. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, well, thank you so much for our, for our audience. I would recommend. Um, just because it's the sign of the times, really, uh, my still my favorite book that you've written, just because it's so such a stark good thing in my library. But Star Spangled Crown is always a goodie, especially in these extremely turbulent times for our republic. So if you, Claude, as a monarchist that you are, really think how could it practically happen in the United States, this might be the fertile groundwork, honestly. Uh, so, uh, it could be. I wouldn't hold my breath, but it might oh, be. No. And I, I would I, I I would be remiss if I didn't recommend highly my latest book. Yes, please. Blessed Emperor Charles, uh, the legacy of a whole, of a holy emperor. Um, it's an important book, uh, not simply because I wrote it, but because uh, the life and witness of uh, Blessed Charles of Austria and his wife, servant of God Zeta are really, really important right now for everything that we're going through. Uh, because as a man, he was an incredibly admirable husband, father, son of a kind of broken, mashed up home. Uh, he was the epitome of a good and just ruler, the epitome of a brave and peace-loving soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the reasons why he pursued peace so so hotly during his brief reign was that unlike most of the other heads of state in Europe and the United States, he had been at the front. He had fought. He was there. And he knew what his men were being put through. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, not that it's all that germane, but it does come to mind, uh, there were, to my recollection, only three uh, rulers that were at the front. Emperor Charles was one, King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy was mm -hmm. the second, and King Albert the, uh, of the Belgians, yep. the so-called King Knight, or Knight King, he, uh, he was also at the front, those three. There was an heir to the throne who was at the front, however, and it certainly had an effect on his life. And that was the Prince of Wales, Edward. Mm. His chauffeur was killed right in front of him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why when he later would become prince and then Edward VIII, he was not keen on a Second World War. And people didn't understand that unless there were veterans. Then they understood. Mm -hmm. That's 
that's extremely apt for today. So that's actually true. Uh, Blessed Carl Ostia, which is on my on my Christmas list, by the way, uh, that actually is a precisely a, a, a perfect read, especially for the times, because one thing that we uh, don't have in the modern era it doesn't seem like is we don't have rulers who exude saintly virtues as well. We often oh. think that, and it's not like it's not like it's it was just suddenly plentiful in in yesteryear, but there have been some rulers. Blessed Carl of Austria, King Louis the the Ninth, um, who who have merited the saintly crown, and how great is that to see uh, civic duty meld with with our our religious duties as well in that sort of regard. Uh, so, oh, and it's and that's why, I mean, if nothing else, if you know the life of Emperor Carl, it will certainly raise the bar for anyone you're uh, you know you're, you're you got ruling you. I, I couldn't help tweeting this earlier. Uh, I said, uh, the Habsburgs aren't perfect. They're just better than anything I've been given to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> well, this might be their opportunity to restore themselves because I know that, that you know, Europe will be facing some tumult anyway. So this might be, the, if, if there's any a time for, for the HRE to, to make its claim, that, 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 that double legal better take flight. That's all I'm saying. Isn't it? <laughs> what, what, real quick, Charles, what is the virtue? Is it that us as, as baptized sons of the church that makes us also citizens of the Holy Roman Empire? Is that how it works? It, it does indeed. Okay. By virtue of being baptized, you are a citizen of Rome, a subject of the empire. Uh, whether you consider that Holy Roman or Byzantine, mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, you, uh, the two expressions of the imperial idea you are still, you know, you're under the double eagle in the uh, immortal, immortal phrase of John Philip Sousa, although he had in mind the symbol of the 33rd degree Freemasonry, which oh. that was such a disappointment to me when I found that out. Like Mozart. When I, was little, when I was little and I saw the name of the song, I thought, mm -hmm. under the double eagle, wow, <laughs> this is an American march. This is great. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah. He didn't mean the same double eagle I met. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Jordan, you want to be an expat? Let's get out of here. Bro. Yo, dude, yeah. I mean, I will always, I've always maintained, I've had this funny little idea in my head that uh, that uh, when, a mon when a Holy Roman Empire is restored and the problem is that they're bringing in all these like American monarchists who not having ever lived under monarchy are extremely enthusiastic about it and are completely annoyed with the European ways of doing things. I'm just like always imagining this court of these like Texans getting mad at the Italians and the Austrians for not being efficient or good enough in their, in their gung ho on the crown. <laughs> it's, well, there's, you know, again, it's, it's like converts versus cradles within mm -hmm. the church. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, and it's understandable. One of the, uh, the name of my head was the Lord Mayor of Hackensack. <laughs> the, uh, of Hackensack, New Jersey. If you could imagine the United States as a monarchy, the Lord Mayor of Hackensack. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I had to do it. I had to uh, dance attendance on His Majesty. And let me tell you something. <laughs> I am proud and honored to be a member of the court. <laughs> I'd love it. I got, uh, as, Lord, as your Lord Mayor here in Hackensack, I got to tell you, when His Majesty comes here, and he's coming, He's going to make a state progress here one of these days. And let me tell you something. Hackensack is going to turn out. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Big oh, time. Yeah. You betcha. <laughs> you, you are going to see. Let me tell you something. When His Majesty is done, he's going to think, and he's going to be right, that Hackensack <laughs> is the best of all His, His Majesty's dominions. Yeah. There isn't any place in this whole <laughs> realm that is better or more loyal to His Majesty than Hackensack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I'd, I'd pay so much money because I think it's 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 you know our natural DNA. So we're all we're sons of the empire. Let's get them. Hack and sack for all. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much for coming on, Charles. We'll have to I'll have you on very soon. And thank you to all of our listeners, all of our subscribers. Um, please, please, please check out Charles's regular podcast, which is Tumblr House. You can get that. You can get that wherever any podcasts are, just like ours. But you can also see them on YouTube. Um, great, great talks, great topics, great highlight sections. Highly would recommend. Of course, wherever you can get Charles's books, please, please do so. Um, you can follow him along on his Twitter. It's pretty fun. So 
<laughs> you know, I, take uh, your... Uh, oh, oh, it's well. Wild. Twitter, yeah, Twitter it's, is it's, one wild place. Yeah, we had a thing on, yeah, it's the Wild West. And um, please, the most important thing you can do for our videos and the most important thing you can do for us, besides your prayers, of course, is if you continue to like, comment, please let us know how you like the episode, subscribe, and really share these videos. Um, we've been very, very grateful for all the support and all of our subscribership that we've been getting recently, thanks be to God. So if you like what we had to do, if you want more guests on, if you know somebody you think would really gel well with the podcast, we're real, real easy to hit. Anywhere podcasts are, here on YouTube, Instagram, just hit us up, no problem. Um, and for us at the Glad Trad Podcast, certainly from Charles, we wish you and your family a good advent of preparation, a Merry Christmas, and may God bless you and Merry keep you. See you on the next one, adios. Oh,